talk basically from start to finish on how you make costume grade armor. And the difference between costume armor and what you might call stage armor is that the armor that I'm wearing right now can't take a beating if someone actually tried to beat me with a stick. That is the difference. Stage armor will allow you to actually hit people and mean it, and you won't hurt them as much. By the way, not baby. You'll still hurt them a little bit. But basically, if you go to Medieval Times or something like Scarborough, oh, yeah, they're wearing yeah. stage armor. What we're going to teach you to make is costume armor. This is stuff you can wear at conventions, and hopefully it will protect you at least against glomping. <laughs> for, for those who don't know what glomping is and have not experienced it, um, good for you. Because glomping is basically tackle hugging from behind. So, at least the armor will protect you from that. So, the very first thing you need to do when you make costume armor is figure out what the heck you need. What pieces of armor you're going to make. You may not have to make full body armor, and I really don't recommend doing that for your very first time. Simply because it's a really complicated task to make full body armor. Just armor in and of itself is very time consuming and it takes a lot of patience. So the very first thing you need to do is decide what is it I need. Do I need you know, gauntlets for the arms? Do I need shoulder blades? Do I need pauldrons? <coughs> do I need a breastplate? Do I need cuisses for the hips? You know, you need to just decide what you need. And if you don't know what the yeah. names of different yeah. pieces of armor are, yeah, you can go to a website called armorarchive.org and it is spelled <coughs> There's nothing wrong with that, just it has to be spelled with a U when you look it up. But not only do they have the names of the different historical pieces of armor, they've also got patterns for you. They've already got pre-made patterns for breastplates, for gauntlets, for pauldrons. They've even got uh, scale mail and chain mail patterns. They've got patterns for what's called lamellar armor, which is just basically little leather plates riveted together in a scale pattern. So that's the first place I would recommend you go if you don't want to make your patterns by scratch, which you can do, and it's actually not as hard as you might think it is. But that's something definitely that you can consult as a resource. So once you've figured out what it is you need, then you need to figure out what you're going to make it out of. And that's going to be the biggest part of our presentation here, is a little bit about all the different materials you can make armor out of. This includes what you're going to make your patterns out of, because obviously you have to have a pattern for your armor, unless you're going to just try and cut it out of whole cloth. I'm not intended. So you need something that you're going to work with. And ideally, when you pattern your armor, you want to use something similar to the end result that you're going to have. So if I'm going to make my armor, say, out of fiberglass, I'm probably going to want a patterning material that is somewhat stiff, so that it will mimic the properties of the fiberglass. If you want to make it, say, out of cloth, you can use post board, you can use a fabric called muslin, you can even use newspaper. You can use any material that's somewhat close. And if, if you can't do that, nobody's going to yell at you. The armor gods are not going to come destroy your armor if you can't use the right kind of material. But that's what's best, that's what's recommended. So once you know that, before you actually start your patterning, there's a couple considerations you need to have for your armor. One is, where the heck are you going to store this stuff? It, it's not like most people have a dress form out in the middle of their living room with armor on it as an art piece. Which you can do. <laughs> and it would look fantastic. It would be a great conversation piece. <laughs> but that's probably not what most people are going to do with their armor. You're going to have to put it somewhere. And somewhere in most cases is going to be a garage or a closet. And you also have to think about, well, do I have a container big enough for this armor? Because hopefully you're not just literally going to throw it in a trash bag into the garage. Please, please don't. That's, that's dishonorable to your armor. <laughs> How many of you guys are here from Houston? I know that's a strange question to ask. See, actually, a lot of you. When you're storing armor, keep Houston in mind because there's a lot of moisture in your garage when you're actually in like South Texas. I mean, Dallas is a little drier up here, but when you're adhesing different pieces of armor, whether you're using some sort of epoxy, some kind of glue, the heat, the moisture, it's going to shift off. Like, I remember, gosh, I was storing a boot in a car and just taking it off the floor of my car after leaving it there for the day, it separated from the sole. So while some of these glues, they are strong enough for you to use it for your convention period, this isn't a, it's not stage armor, it's not supposed to be 
for multiple shows every night of the week. It's not supposed to be used for um, multiple renaissance fairs uh, you know, over and over and over again. A lot of the, the more delicate costume pieces, whether you're casting out of fiberglass or using a plastic, it's still only going to hold up for about eight to 10 hours per day, hopefully in a weekend, and then afterwards you just want to keep it in a nice pristine condition so that you can mend it and then get it ready for your next convention. Mm -hmm. The other two considerations to have when building armor, First is con restrictions. Not all cons will let you have certain materials, and you really don't want to have the con tell you that you can't wear your uber nice armor because it's made out of a banned material like fiberglass, shellac, or full-on stainless steel. So you don't want to have this awesome project that you can't actually wear anywhere. So do make sure you check with the con. Usually it's in the same place as weapon restrictions. They'll have about the same material restrictions. And the last thing to think about is the hardest, and the one that everybody has issues with, us included, is how the heck you're going to put it on. Attaching armor is probably the hardest part of the whole project. Making it, cinch. Putting it on and keeping it on, that's the hard part. And that's something that you need to think about as you're patterning, because you have to think, well, as soon as I'm done with this, now what? I mean, I'm going to have a shoulder pad that can actually sit on my shoulder unless I do something about that. So that's all of the things that you really need to consider as you're working on your patterns. Now, when you do your patterns, you basically have two options. You can do it with the proportion method. Basically, you take a picture of the actual character, ideally full body, just so that you have a full shot that you can measure from. So you have a picture of the Hopefully not stick figure dude, because that's really hard to make on. <laughs> and then of course you have your own body. Basically, you're going to do a bunch of math comparing the different sizes between them to make sure that your armor is the same size on you as the armor is proportionally to the picture. So if I have a sword in the picture that's eight inches long, and I measure my body, and it's twice as big, then I need a sword that's 16 inches long. If the math makes sense. Can we get the dressmaker's dog with it? Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I can see my dress form walked. I told you it was going to walk. <laughs> but this is the proportional method. This is a, a lot of math. So if you are not a math person, this may not be the best method for you. You can also actually uh, look up online um, how many heads tall you are. You might have seen that Marvel characters, like the Marvel comics, are a much different proportion size than anime characters because I think Marvel characters are like eight heads tall for no reason. That said, um, some of the math online, if you aren't a math person, you can find that because there are people who use it for maybe not armor proportion stuff, but just other artistic endeavors as well. And of course the other method is the relative method, and that's where you measure approximately where something falls on somebody. This tends to work better if you don't have precise proportions, like the perfect hourglass for women and the straight as a board for men. If you're not perfectly proportioned, relative is actually better because you look at the picture of your dude or dudette, as you prefer, and you look at approximately where the armor falls on them. So if it falls, like maybe say, to the elbow on them, your armor needs to fall to the elbow on you, wherever that happens to be. Then you don't have to use so much of math as you do, you just have to kind of visualize it to make sure that relatively to the picture, it looks about the same. Which for me, that's a great thing because I know that I have different body proportions than the hourglass. I can't use the mathematical proportions because if I did, this waist cincher would actually be all the way up here on me. And it would look really weird because then it wouldn't be a waist cincher anymore. <laughs> so because of that, I have to use the relative method. Now for weapons, it's actually sometimes easier to use the numbers. Uh, how do you do your pattern when you pattern your armor? It really just depends on what kind of costume it is. Sometimes you'll have characters that don't have a full body armor suit and they'll just have like a bracer or a piece, etc. Um, when you're drafting any kind of pattern for a costume, I, it's not necessarily what everyone should do, but I like to just start like thinking of what the shape is, cutting it out, and just kind of getting a feel of myself. Um, a lot of times I use a lot of paper stuff, and I kind of skip the middle step where you're supposed to actually make the prototype, and I do recommend making a prototype because you'll save a lot of money on materials, not, you know, goofing it up. But paper is always my favorite, and then I start, you know, pinning stuff on. Um, craft home is also a nice affordable way um, to start building essentially mock prototype armor. And in some cases, craft home actually can be your finalized product. It gives you a way to like test and sculpt and see what the material does. 
Um, but for the most part, when you're doing full body armor pieces, um, measurements are really important because you don't want to make something, okay, it fits on my chest, but then not have any breathing room. Um, a lot of materials don't have a lot of give to it, so you're basically making like a Chinese breath, death trap or something, with full finger things. So, uh, cool. Usually when I pattern off my armor, including what I did for this armor, I end up doing something that I just like to call the poster board method. I take a giant piece of poster board, I grid it out in inches, and then I hold it up to my body in large chunks. So I'll cut out a big chunk, bigger than I think I'm going to need it. You always want to have too much and not have enough. And then I hold it up and just see if it's generally about the right size. And if it's about the right size, then I'll start taking a pencil and putting in my outlines and shaving it down. Now granted, the nice thing about the poster board method is that if for some reason you shave off too much, you can always use your best friend, which is duct tape or masking tape, and you can just take more poster board on there and then keep going. I like to use poster board because most of my armor is soft armor. So poster board is flexible enough to kind of mimic the fun foam and fabric that I prefer to use for my armor because I store mine in a paper box. <laughs> it's actually literally about this thing. All my armor fits in here. And I store it over two liter bottles. <laughs> so that's something, that's something I had to think about when I patterned out my armor is where am I going to store it? Well, I can only make it big enough to fit in a paper box because I have a tiny, tiny little apartment closet. And when you store it over two liter bottles, it helps me because it keeps the roundness of the shape of the armor at all times. So that when I take it out, it's nice and round and fits my shoulders. So that's just how it ended up working for me. But I used poster board for the pattern for these and kept those things in mind as I was patterning it. Breast plates are a little bit harder when you use poster board or any sort of paper because if you've ever tried to put paper over a round object like a globe or a ball, you get a very messy, wrinkly mess. And that's simply because you're trying to form a 2D shape over a 3D shape. And the way to fix that problem is something called darts. Does anybody in this room not know what darts are? There's a couple people. Basically, all a dart is so that you end up getting something more of a pyramid instead of a flat piece of paper when you put it back together. This is how women tend to have to work on their breastplates because women are rounder up top. <laughs> and so we have to have our materials conform to the curves so that they fit properly and so you don't look like Katy Perry. <laughs> Incidentally, so you know, if you have a circle this is the center of the circle. The deeper in toward the middle you cut your darts, the more pointy the circle is, the more pointy the pyramid. If you cut small darts like this, you get a rounder shape. You won't get the point at the top quite so much, you get more of a, a rounded dart. So, something to think about when making your patterns. Unless you're making a Katy Perry costume, and then have at it. So, that covers darts. Anything else you think about patterning before we get into materials? Um, unless anybody has any questions, although as a brief refresher on the darts, um, you can find a lot of that sort of form-fitting stuff in actually like cloth sewing patterns. Most of the darts, if you've ever worked with a normal like paper um, pa uh, pattern from Joanne's or whatever, it's got little darts already cut. So if you want to kind of get used to how the math on that goes, how all those folds are, and how deep they need to be, um, just pull a paper pattern actually. It's not even the worst idea for starting uh, si certain simple ones. And you can actually go to Simplicity for question. Do you plan that out ahead of time or do you put everything made and then try to figure out how you're going to Yes and no. It honestly depends on how you're going to attach the strapping. Basically, there are two ways. You can either thread it through your armor, in which case you do have to plan that in advance. Kind of the weaving method. If you just glue it on with adhesive, you don't have to worry about that until the end. So it just depends on how you want your strapping to go in, and how long you want it to stay on, and how hot it's going to be in your car when you have to store the stuff. <laughs> well, we'll talk about why you don't use hot glue on armor later. So speaking of, speaking of materials, 
Um, I guess I'm more of a plastics kind of guy. I like to melt stuff, not in my free time, but only for like fun. <laughs> um, plastics are a lot of fun. There's a lot of different types of uh, chemical materials and heat-based materials you can use. Uh, what's really popular right now is Borbola and Wonderflex. You might see that online. Um, those are basically, I, I don't even know, they look like ice cream cones, but they're essentially foams that make uh, various shapes of them up. Um, they are a little less heat intensive than some of the other type of plastics that can be used. I like to use uh, the Stormtrooper stuff, that's the um, 0.04 styrene, and it's actually only a fourth of an inch to 2% uh, of an inch of plastic. And what you do, we're actually going to show you guys later in the hour, um, you can basically make your craft foam shapes um, and make your armor in advance and then lay it on your vacuum foam table, and then the vacuum sucks everything down and the heat actually melts over it. Um, there are some cautions with that. The plastic can be very thin or very rich depending on how thick the plastic you're using it. It's, it's hard to get that really like, you know, goldy watch just right uh, medium. But plastic is very, very affordable. Um, it, it takes less time uh, than resin and it's really lightweight. And you'll see that little yard of plastic over there. I bought maybe 30 square yards of that for just a couple of dollars a yard a long time ago. And I haven't bought anything new since because this is it's just, all plastic. Yeah, I mean, you can, and you get it at like plumbing stores and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of like it's almost as tall as me. <laughs> it's a hidden gem in there. Actually, um, I'm gonna point this out in advance. You know how we said don't use hot glue? Um, this was a breastplate that I used a while ago, and it had a couple of adornments. It's made out of plastic stuff, so I think it's a great example of armor and whatnot. But over time, from being stored in closets and stuff, it shouldn't be. The hot glued on pieces fell off, and that's the problem with hot glue. Is it's only temporary. Hot glue is really good if you need to get out on that stage floor, like right now. But we're going to show this around, and you'll see there's um, a lot of scarring and scarging on that stuff. Speaking of hot plastics, when you want to use thermoplastics, which are basically just any plastic that melts into a shape using heat, you're going to need one of these. This is a heat gun. The one I have happens to be an industrial strength heat gun because it's adjustable. It'll go many different temperatures, so Wonderflex will melt at 175 degrees. I seriously hope that your home hair dryer does not get to 175 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's important to know this is Celsius, not just like baking temperatures. Yes. Incidentally, do not use one of these to blow dry your hair. Please, for the love of God, do not. Also, don't use it on wigs. This does not work as a wig blow dryer because it will literally melt your wig to bits. Experience. <laughs> yes. This is meant to melt plastic. It's also meant to strip paint, should you need it for that. But it's also meant to work with foam, which I guess I will take over yeah. for this part. Most of my armor, as you can see, is foam and fabric. And it's because, basically on the armor continuum, this is the second most flexible material you can work with. In fact, I'm going to go all gamer on you people. <laughs> because I am a gamer. On the armor continuum of doing goodness, you basically have durability on one side, and then you have flexibility on the other. And I'm not saying that you can't have both, because if you have both, you're somewhere in the center of that continuum. So you have flexibility and durability. Or, of course, in gamer terms, you have that, <laughs> Die and survive. Well, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna take it all the way to the end because I'm a geek and I don't wanna like lose my geek card for going so far. Our points will go down. Yes. But anyways, basically most people want to be somewhere in the middle on this continuum. You're probably not gonna have armor that is so inflexible that you can't sit with one of the bathroom and experience again. <laughs> Or armor that is so flexible that you can't even get lumped my seat in the hallway before it breaks. Because you don't want to be remaking this every year, right? You want to make your armor one time, maybe two, one time, and then not have anything happen to it. So I make it out of foam. This happens to be EVA foam. For those who don't know what EVA foam is, basically a yoga mat. They sell these in Home Depot, in Rhodes, and Harbor Freight in your friendly local hardware store. They usually come in packs of four, and if you get them on sale, they're about eight bucks. And one pack can get you a full body set of armor. Eight bucks for a full body set of armor? That's pretty good. That's pretty cheap. And then you buy the heat gun, which is another 40 bucks, and so it's actually 48 bucks for a full body set of armor. <laughs> but anyways, what you do, this is gonna get slightly loud. Basically, 
You take your piece of foam that you want to bend, you're going to aim the heat over it and keep it moving. Because if you leave the heat down in one place, you're going to get a nice, giant, whole size piece through the center of your foam where the heat gun was, because it will burn through the foam. You'll also sear the foam if you leave it too long. So you want to keep it moving. Right now, I've actually got a director nozzle on it to help keep the air exactly where I want it. And most heat guns come with one. And you gradually bend the foam. And then when you turn off the heat gun, you hold it there for a second and let it cool. So that when you're done, it should mostly hold its shape. So hopefully, Murphy aside, this is going to work. <laughs> so here we go. So I'm taking it, I'm going to bend it in the center, get pretty close to it. I'm going to try and do this angle where you guys can see it. You see I'm constantly moving the heat gun. Right now this is set at about 400 degrees. That's about pretty hot, it'll boil water. So you really don't want this anywhere near your hands or skin. Or your little slip. Notice though that you don't need any goggles or gloves as long as you're controlling that heat in a nice responsible manner. I mean you can even bring this to the convention center. Um, I'm going to do something similar with my vacuum form box. We make props in, in the hotel room. So. You also do both sides. Both sides of the curve and the joint. So if you ever want to form pieces say around your arms, incidentally, don't put it on your arm right after you heated it up. <laughs> That goes for any body part, and also do not keep form it directly onto your body. Just say. Just say. Just like another thing go for it, like the heat does it. And then like just form it. So you just put that, you just place that gun around the armor thing, and then then it works. Smoke. See. Smells. Yeah. 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 Crab foam is actually really good for a lot of more delicate pieces too. Um, they make kind of like lesser, um, thinner crab foam. It's not good for like making full suits of armor, but when you have to do things like bracers and whatnot, the Lake Legend of Zelda, um, it's always good for when you're just trying to make something that you're not sure it's going to work for something. Yeah, it holds a chick. Is that how you pass around? Yeah, they do cool really fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> do not try this at home. I mean, try it at home, but don't do that. <laughs> do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> and, and I'm actually going to unplug the heat gun just in case I yeah, have to set something on fire. I, <laughs> for the, uh, the plastic stuff, you have to use uh, a lower grade heat gun. We'll put one of the higher grade heat guns on lower settings because just like the EVA foam will eventually melt or the wig should be used on uh, thin plastic, is really fragile, it's really sensitive. So if you don't mind, I love uh, to make something. Um, I'm gonna go. Let, let this cool off. Before you yeah, yeah. Let me let me not. I'm gonna make a pair of scissors and I'm gonna take them off and cut them out with them. I need. Does anybody have any paper? I need actually something to clog the air holes. Because I built this vacuum cleaner box bigger than I needed to, and I'll explain how. Oh, that works too. Yes. I just have to keep the paper away from the heat gun. No, I don't. I don't. Um, since I'm not going to be able to talk that much while it's going on because this vacuum is loud, um, I'll explain the process. Basically, this is just a box with holes on it with a vacuum attachment strapped in so that this five, power, four, five horsepower vacuum, essentially, you can see it right there, the paper immediately starts to slow down. So I'm going to get a piece of that plastic, put it over the scissors here, and then blast the heat gun on about four or 500 degrees Celsius, and then slowly but surely, it's going to magically melt into a pair of scissors. You probably don't need scissor armor, but you can see the application. <laughs> you can see the applications of taking a piece of like the craft home link bracer that I just passed around. If you need it to be more durable, if you need it to have a bunch of uh, scallops across your armor, all the same shape and size, you can just make the one scallop and then go through the back and form tool and go over and over and over and over. And I mean that, just like we said, a lot of these materials are not that expensive. You don't have to go all out and get like the brand name stuff. Uh, the EVA foam is available at the hardware stores, and the plastic is available at plumbing stores. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. Let's Incidentally, hope. if you want to build one of these at home for yourself, you can. There are instructions both on the internet, or if you want to get the mold and casting handbook, I believe the author is James Thurston. It's a big yellow book. Not only is it fantastic for molding, but in the back are instructions on how to make a 2x2 two two vacuum form machine from start to finish. 2x2 two two is large enough to fit in an apartment. And you can even put it on caster wheels so you can move it around. 
It does take a little bit of hardware know-how, so if you know how to use a hammer and nails, you should be okay. And, and maybe a drill on random occasions. The most important thing on your box is you need to regulate airflow. So you need to make sure that all of the sides that don't have holes in it um, can be covered. I use aluminum tape on the side, but you'll actually see there's just some contact paper because I was short-handed. You just need to make sure that the only airflow that's coming through is sucking this down. I'm going to turn this on real fast so you can see how it just basically goes down a little bit. So yeah, as you see, the box kind of caves in on its own weakness, and so using that in mind, we're going to drop the scissors in, blast out the heat gun. I'm making scissors. I'm going to use the lightweight one because I'm, I'm, I'm scared. Well, mine's unplugged, so okay. you kind of have to. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what well, I would do. Mine was smoking. I'm not sure. It goes up to 1300 Celsius, right? Yes. I don't know what I would do with 1300 Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> That's too much power. I'm, I'm kind of a closet pirate, so bacon, and and sugar. Sugar. We're still <laughs> on the other side. Other side. It's in front of the oh, certified awesome. yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You probably want to make sure that it's not so far. <laughs> okay. So here we go, guys. You're, feel free to like, leave more, because it's really fun to see. Highly. It's basically an amber color. <laughs> 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 I'll pretend I 
right. Hear that. This is an amber colored liquid that basically looks like molasses. Do not eat. <laughs> and you mix it with a hardener. This is basically what they call a two part resin, which means you have to mix part A and part B to get your final result. This is hardener, this tiny itty bitty little thing, because you only use it in drops compared to literally cups of fiberglass resin. It does not take very much of this. This is what makes it keep. <laughs> so use it according to the directions that are on the can, because they tell you exactly how many drops of hardener to use with the resin. So it can be a good investment to purchase a medical scale so that you can actually weigh it. Yep. Or you can have a measuring cup. Some of them actually provide measuring cups so that you can measure by volume instead of by weight. Either way, you really need to measure your fiberglass because you don't want to set it or your piece on fire. Perfect timing for resin and fiberglass. Hi guys! The parking outside is fun. So yes. Guys, this is the cool version. It's kind of our fiberglass CD resin. Yeah, I can no. talk about stuff. I know. Oh, that's true. No, I don't know where you guys are at. So we actually, I just talked about the resin itself, so you may want to talk about what you use it on, say fiberglass mat. You're using some heavy duty resin there. Can I say you could buy like little cheapy resin for smaller things, like at Michaels? Well, I bought this at Walmart for 15 bucks. It's Heck yeah, auto body <laughs> resin. It's auto body resin. What could I say? I'm cheap, and I needed a lot of it because I need full body armor, and so this will get me a lot. This of stuff too, if you're using it for weapons and things, I would assume that's that why it you use it. Yeah, it's it huge. If you're going for something for accessories, there's also doming resin and there's ice resin, and you can get that at Michaels, Joanne's, and you just you can get a little tray of some sort. You can get a coke bottle, you can pour resin into it. Usually, it's going back on a lot of walk. You can use resin by itself. I know a lot of people will try and use it as a lacquer or a shellac and just paint it on and try and burn something. It doesn't always work. It depends on the material. I actually tried it on a bow that I brought to the con and it was made of foam board, this stuff in the core, and craft foam sandwiched on the other sides of it. I painted it just with the resin, no cloth, nothing, just the resin. It flopped. It literally did this. Thank you, you have to read My core, it. the core of the bow actually melted and it was destroyed. So I actually had to, to paper mache the outside of the bow to actually build it back up again so it didn't look like this. If you're looking for something that, like, like she said, if you just want to cut something out of foam board and you want to cover it, a few things that I like to use are at Michael's for you go to on super cheap. They have an air dry paper mache that I've literally made stacks out of, like by just getting a coil of wire and sitting there and smushing this stuff all the way up it, and it dries. Oh, look! Look at this girl. I love her. <laughs> I, I thought like my whole studio. This, um, this, this stuff is, is wonderful. It is like clay, and you can just absolutely do anything with it. And then, like she said, don't use resin as a shellac. You could even use shellac. This is basically a pre-dried. It's a dust, which is why I don't want to take it too far out of the bag because it just goes like a mushroom. So this is actually fast mache. Oh, so that's a powder type. Yeah, yeah they have one that's a powder type. As well. It's like a gray you can color. See, it kind of goes everywhere. All the smoky mess. All you have to do is add water. It's like pancake mix. Just add water. Don't eat again. Never <laughs> underestimate <laughs> paper mache. It's yes. Really, I know this it's stuff is fantastic. It's, it sands beautifully. Because that's a problem you have to think about with armor. Is you're going to paint it later. You want to have a nice smooth surface. You need to pick a material that's sandable and fiberglass it is not. Which also, I don't know if they talked about something called Crayola Bottle Magic. Not yet. No. But, yeah. Yeah, that's right, fans of Crayola Bottle Magic. Crayola. We're not nerds at all. No. <laughs> but I actually, that stuff that. is great for uh, roll it, and you can use it for small details, and you can basically do anything. And it air dries. And it air dries. Yeah, it air dries. I've yeah. used it for elf ears before, too. If you have like some really zany ears or horns to make, it's yeah. really lightweight. It makes a nail match really great. Yeah, that. You can use it for anything. So if you can just get a small bag, it's pretty cheap just to play with, and you'll know how the material works. Um, another one that we could use also is Bondo. I don't know who's playing with Bondo. Who doesn't have brain cells? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think I made that out of it. Bondo is what they use to fix car doors. So like if you get a like, it's dent in your car door, they basically hollow it out and pull it out and then use Bondo. You got a hole in your boat. <laughs> yeah, so this is like like really industrial material and accordingly just like you don't want to burn yourself and put that on your head. You also don't want to use any of these chemical based or other materials in a closed space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now one point I'm going to make a, 
uh, Death Note, the giant scythe out of Bondo, and that's something that has such a wide space to it. Bondo gets heavy fast. I would recommend it for daggers or like things that like are armor pieces, shoulder pads. But nothing that would be like on the tip of your toe or something supposed to stand up. And seriously, do it in a super like outside, in the middle of the park, away from family and friends, because it just. I, I did it in the bathroom. It was the worst idea ever. My <laughs> <laughs> wedding marker sniffing has no match. <laughs> I fired last for the first time this year in my apartment. Oh, don't do that. No. I will never do that again. My apartment smelled for six hours, and I was really glad my landlord didn't well, come up to see me. Also, make sure to wear, um, I would say, wear a respirator. Wear a respirator. One thing about fiberglass, and remember this when you pick up the box. Whenever you breathe it in, it's a non-organic material. It will sit in your lungs. Forever until your body like absorbs it and puts it in the kidney sometime in the evening. So just please be careful with it. Put on masks, use precautions, go on YouTube and just watch other people. Yeah, do YouTube it. is such watch a great resource. Um, back when we were like cosplay kids, you used, to go, on, like, my day. used to go on like there wasn't really Google, you used to go on like Lycos or Angel Fire, and you'd find a cosplay <laughs> tutorial. And it'd be like step one, buy the stuff, step two, and this is like kind of a progress picture, and step three, it's like a beautiful finished Inuyasha sword. So take advantage of the fact that like there's a lot of people putting the time in on YouTube. The materials, dude. You can never find materials to actually oh, yeah. do anything you want. Now it's just a it's a whole Yeah. It's cheap and affordable and separate. So yeah, there's I didn't mean to go off that. <laughs> no, never. There's all kinds of materials you can obviously use for armor that we haven't even talked about. There's chain mail, which is basically just a bunch of rings woven together in a pattern. If you go to a website called mailartisans.org, they have several dozen <laughs> tutorials. Not only with computer models, but actually with physical pictures of somebody showing you with colored rings so you can see in what order they go. I go here myself when I move channel. It is tedious, but it is super rewarding. Like if it's a piece that, especially if you make it something generic like a vest mm -hmm. that you can re wear on like a ring fair costume, like you can always re them. Mm -hmm. Yes, you so. can make them out of soda tabs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, you can. You can make yeah. them out of, save all of your Coke tabs and all those of your coworkers and friends because yes, you can do it, and it actually looks pretty darn good. If you're flying, yeah. you're gone also. For a year and a half, though. I, I, I ran out of tab yes. before I finished. Yes. They, they do have maintenance issues with coat tab vests and shirts, but if you're going to do it, you may as well go all the way. You can go to places like the Ring Lord to order rings supplies. Rings are not expensive at all. So. Yeah, ring, rings are cheap. You can even make your own if you have a little rotary tool. You can cut the wire yourself. But it's if you're going to get it, it takes a lot of time. So if you want to just get a whole bunch of rings at once, go online. There's a ton of bulk sellers. It's going to take you probably between six and 10,000 rings, just telling you in front. It's make a best. So you really better love what you're doing on that one. And have a lot of really good You better be into that anime, like into it. Or like a year later, you're like, what do I have this for? But another thing too is you can use stuff that we're not talking about. Like I know some cosplayers get like really into leather or really into one thing and that's all they want to talk about, but you can use anything. Like I think one of the best costumes ever that I saw was a guy who made a uh, Megatrizord, Megatron, out of, cardboard. Out of, he made it out of nacho boxes because he worked in a theater. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like pots too, like I actually took, I, I needed uh, slated um, armor on one side, took pots, like those little green cheapy ones from Walmart, cut them in half, used a textured spray paint, put it on in little rows, voila, <laughs> rivets, boom, it's done. So, speaking of spray paint, Oh yeah, um, you always want to be careful. I like to Google, can you do this before I do it? Because there's a lot of materials. <laughs> it's, you know, uh, there's a lot of materials that essentially, especially with um, the foam, they don't take spray paint very well. They don't like spray it. Spray paint plus foam, bad. It's like a melted mess. I like to put down a uh, fusion spray paint first if I'm doing anything on plastics. A fusion, it just basically melds in with it, and then I'll do stuff over the top of that. But Textured spray paint is the wave of the future. Usually, they have it at Walmart. It is awesome to use on everything. What you'll want to usually do with armor first, if you don't know for sure if spray paint is going to melt it to death, oh is to gosh. put a barrier. And you'll see these are the most popular ones. This is Mod Podge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for Mod Podge! This is basically a watered-down glue, so if, we, if you want to use just regular school white glue, you can. 
but you can buy this in Joann's. It's about five bucks, and this will last you forever and ever. They have matte and they have glossy. It doesn't really matter which one you use because you're going to paint over it anyway. Also, you can use this if you're working with resin. If you like are putting out a picture or something that you want to cover with resin, you cover it first with Mod Podge and seal it in because resin reacts with paper and paints and peels it up sometimes. So Mod Podge does everything. This is gesso. This is the other thing you usually hear about. This is more commonly used with canvas painters than it is with armorers. But basically, it's a really, really thick primer. It's, it's even thicker than glue. It's actually more like frosting. <coughs> mm. But this, all basically gesso is for is covering the pores and making a barrier. Well, that's not going to pour out. It's, Enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> it's water soluble, so it washes out the water should you spill it on your carpet, as I have done many times. But you paint this over your armor. Realistically, you only need about two layers of it. And then you spray paint on top of it. The last thing you can use, unfortunately, this is the least flexible of the bunch. This is the con for sort of inflexible armor one, is wood glue. This is actually wood glue in here, even though the package doesn't say that. Uh, wood glue you find in your local hardware store. Usually it's used for furniture, but it makes a fantastic sealant for armor because it's incredibly strong. And you only need one layer of it. You can water it down just like you do for paper mache, or you can water it down with white gold. I think we had a question back there. Yeah. As you know, I wanted to comment on the wood glue and the cardboard. That's what that's made out of. Nice. I guess my helmet is it's made out of cardboard. If you want to bring it down to the front so I can yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I love That thing was sturdy, man. Especially right? watered down. You just paint it on with a brush. Incidentally, after you've painted with a brush, using any of these chemicals, unless you want to get disposable brushes, you need to clean your brushes. Really? Okay. <laughs> so everybody can see how we made this thing. This is sturdy. I was really surprised. You can see the inside of here. Wow. It's cardboard and wood glue. Oh, okay. And look, that looks super professional. That's really awesome. Let's give it a hand for this guy. Expensive stuff, if you go blow a lot of money on it, that doesn't mean you're going to get a good thing. Like most often, if you're just creative and you have the shapes down, that's all you need. So. When you go to clean your brushes after you use fiberglass or use the paper mache or sealing, unless you want to get the dollar disposable brushes and a giant trash can because you're going to go through a lot of them, you either want to get brush solvent, you can get this in the artist section of hobby stores. Or you can get the girl's best friend, acetone. Oh. <laughs> girl's best friend, yes. yes. You know, Paul Kimber, basically. Um, do not pour this near fiberglass resin, because the heat of fiber, this is probably one of the most flammable substances you want to work with. Safety first. So just. So keep, cardboard's keep, looking real good. Cardboard's looking real good. This is probably, if you use this for fiberglass resin, this is the only thing that will save your brushes. You can use fiberglass resin brushes over and over again if you clean them with this properly. It's a lot cheaper than having to buy a whole, you know, bandolier of brushes just so that you can fiberglass because fiberglass resin sets in 15 minutes. After that, you've washed a brush. So you go through brushes real quick. But if you clean them, you can use yes, them over and over again. Proper maintenance. Yes, that's proper maintenance. And again, outside with all of this, guys. Yeah. Yes, Every please. All of this, Safety please. equipment, wear splash goggles with side guards, wear a respirator rated for fiberglass, if that's what you're doing, especially if you're sanding it. And uh, if it's windy outside, please be kind to your neighbors and sweep it up when you're done. Yes, please. And if we hear that one of you guys blow yourself up, we're going to be really sad. I never told you to do it. No. <laughs> But we will be sad. Just, just, not because, like, just because these are dangerous chemicals doesn't mean you can't work with them at all. Yeah, you may have to sacrifice a couple of brain cells, but what's that as your name of the cosplayer? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> I don't know, we're already sure of you. It's okay. No, just safe, safety first in all things, but otherwise these are no more toxic than anything else that you work with on a daily basis, as long as you, you know, take proper procedure with it. So, you know, that's all I wanted to say there. Don't get disheartened if like you're working on your project for the first time and for some reason the shapes don't line up. Um, cosplay is a, a work of art. It's, it's a always moving target that you're trying to reach for. I mean, we've all got horror stories. I've clapped and stuff to myself that I never should have tried, but 
it, it, <laughs> it, it happens. I mean, things of... I saw it, my friend rip part of her chest off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we're still, we're all figured stuff. I electrocuted there. myself once with that. You did electrocute yourself. That was, that was, was great. But... <laughs> <laughs> Take some time, even with the back and forth stuff. It took me a long time to figure out like how long was too long with my heat gun uh, before the plastic melted and started popping holes in there. So it just, if you know, if it's not right the first time, just keep trying. Don't give up, guys. Oh, you're painting. How many of you want to make metallic looking armors? Or metallic That's a lot of hands. hands. That's a lot of hands. How the heck do you give it the metal look without actually using steel? Which, please, for the love of God, do not actually make steel armor. Don't make it heavy for yourself. You're going to be miserable. Yes, yes you will. They make specific lines of spray paint by various companies. This one happens to be Plastic Oat. This one is everybody's favorite, Krylon. They also make a fusion line. Basically, you want the ones that have metallics on them. You can tell by the color of the cap. Fusion, again, great for plastics. If you're doing something yes. that you're not quite sure of the material, fusion for that stamp on it. Mm -hmm. And it may take a couple of coats of these paints. You may have to sand between coats and then redo it again to get that mirror-like shine. If you're really looking for a chrome look, you can actually get automotive chrome paint and use that on your armor. Just make sure that you take the precautions that you need to first in terms of getting a nice You can also put this on a little bit too thick if you're not careful, so take your time, make it light. Yeah, so the way that Krylon works is it makes an envelope of a plasticky paint substance around the object. So if you're having drips, those are drips made of plastic, so we try to scrape them off. If it's dry, the whole thing comes up with like a layer of skin. I think we have time for one question we saw back here. Oh no, are you just waving? Oh, okay. Hi, Joe. <laughs> if you want to protect... You can the scissors. If you want to protect the paint, you can use glaze. This is acrylic glaze, but there are other. You can use uh, pledge floor polish. I have heard works wonders if you want a mirror-like finish to have nice, smooth, shiny armor. You can use any number of things that are polishes or glazes. So just make sure that you know when you store it for long periods of time, it's going to get dusty. So you'll have to kind of buff it every so often to keep that nice mirror-like shine. If you want a rubbery finish, You'll get something called plastic dip. Plastic dip is what they use to give tools rubber handles. This is basically spray rubber. It's extremely flexible. We are intrigued by the plastic dip. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's a, that could be fun. You, you can get this in a container where you can dip things into it. That's what they use for tools. If you're doing it with armor, you can get the spray can right. And then you can just get the shape. And <coughs> exactly. You just spray it on just like you do spray paint. Yes. Would you say the name again? Real loud. Plasti dip. Plasti dip. Plasti is that an honor? Thank you. And then I have a question. Where is she over here? Actually, she answered my question. Oh, you're trying to get that. Okay. Back here? How do you prevent the drips? It's, it's just going really, really light on it. That's the trick, is that really, really light coats, and then let it dry. Because if you come back and it's still tacky, then you're going to get wet, dry paint on top of wet paint, and it'll never dry. So that's the trick. And just, it's going to be annoying, but just light as you can each time. This is an It's plastic. Plastic. I'm going to be writing that one down too. Also, in the back. Yes, you can. Yes, because you have to worry about releases. Yep. Absolutely. Also, for your armor, you can use something that they like to call in the forums. It's called Rondo. Rondo is basically a mixture of resin and Bondo. And it's lots of fun. Usually, it's really used for chemically. <laughs> it is really chemically. It's a soup. But it makes the hardest, smoothest armor you will ever see in your life. Rondo. So remember that. Rondo, like, like the music thing. Well, which is kind of funny because Bondo was just a fill, a, a, right. a, a, a filler. The resin is the and castor, and Bondo is the filler. So That's brilliant. Bondo. Oh, attachments. Did you talk about yeah, attachments. Yeah. Now, once you've made your armor, uh, there's a lot of different ways to get it on, and it depends on what you're working with. If you're working with things that are uh, lightweight or plastic, sometimes hot glue is an option, but remember, hot glue. Besides the fact, I mean, you guys all saw the breastplate, the hot glue comes off. The other thing is, it's a very heated material as well. So if you put a hot, soupy plastic on your more plastic, you can actually scorch your plastic armor. If you've got plastic armor, foam armor, or any of the lighter materials, you can actually ruin your armor. Also, chances are it's going to come off. Yeah, and chances are it's going to come off at like the worst time. It's like entry number 31. 
Uh -oh. um, with that in mind, Velcro, obviously we, we um, have to pay tribute to the Velcro gods, because this has got Velcro, me Velcro, get the stuff that says industrial strength, because you will be very happy that you did. The industrial strength stuff is meant for putting like tools on top of a beam on the ceiling or something. I like to stitch down my Velcro too on top of it. If you're just worried about the Velcro strip itself coming off, just hand stitch it in there. So. Question. Um, is there any difference in how you can use like the hot melt hot glue and the not so like the industrial? Uh, the difference hot between the temperature melts is simply the temperature at which you will remelt. Yeah, I was just wondering if like the higher grade subjects last like potentially. It depends on how much weight you're putting on it and how hot the environment is in which it's kept. Also yeah. guys, if you need like some other light attachments or there's just something that's kind of coming up, bring Gorilla Tape with you to the convention. Yeah. Anybody who mentions duct tape, you just say you're old news. <laughs> like Gorilla Tape, oh my god, just get a roll from Walmart they sell it at now. Yeah, Gorilla Tape is meant, it's another plumbing tool like these plastics, it's meant to seal leaks. So if you've got a leaky pipe, you're really supposed to just go with Gorilla Tape and just done. And like duct tape will it. never look the same again to you. You'll be like, why is this? It's just cloth. Careful. Oh, it's gorilla Tape will take your skin off. Let me, let me no, we it. have seen it take the skin. That was a related story. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so it's also not just me being jaded. Yeah, so don't okay. right now. They also make Gorilla Tape now in this huge thick oh, double line. Oh, it's wonderful. It's like this wide cross. You can use it to reinforce joints on. If you just have problems, try it out. It doesn't work enough. Yeah, I'm just saying. I haven't used it. I used it. I mean, you know of it. It's used for Gavin's safe as well. So it's around heat and it's around everything. So now we're trying to develop people's heads. We may not be trying that. We're still going to see Okay. Yes. I'm going to say this, I'm sorry. Uh, what type of glue do you use to fasten maybe straps to your phone? You got it. You brought everything. <laughs> Uh, I was about to say E6000. E6000! Yeah. It's jewelry glue, so it'll... Put it's meant to come with diamonds. E6000. This is probably the best stuff next to automotive grade glue. You have to let it set. Close. That's the only thing with it. you got to give it You have to give it at least 24, 48 hours to set, so this is not a quick glue, but it will hold better than anything else I have ever tried, and it smells like <laughs> heaven, so please bet like... Oh, this is another one. This is another smell. Yes, sir. Does that work with proper lives? Yes. Yeah. It should work for better. It, it should as long as you clamp it and you get it to set on there long enough, then it should be fine. The only thing it may or may not work for very well is craft foam, and that's simply because as a resin-based glue, it may eat away at your foam. It actually does eat foam. So simply put a barrier between it, like put a layer of gesso or Mod Podge or white glue on it first, then use the glue and it won't melt your foam. And there's also Gorilla Glue, made by the same people who make Gorilla yes. Tape. You check them out. It, it does expand. Yeah. Gorilla Glue. I didn't get to play with it too much, I just knew it was a good hole, but... But question... Well, it's actually something that, um... So there's actually a website called This to That, which will tell you, yes. um, you know, what, if you have questions... This to That. Oh, I love that website. It's linked on our own website, actually. So we've been doing it. It's a slow way by typing into Google. Like, does Gorilla Tape yeah, have so it's a lot safer than This to That. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, it's not it is, it's okay. not you can always Google it if you don't know. So it's this to that .com. And it will tell you, you can it's got a little drop down menu box. You can select the material you're using and the material that you want to attach it to, and it will tell you what sort of piece of you should use. They are very big fans of 3M's 77 super glue, which I actually have not had very good success on, but I will simply put it out there as something that you can try. Also, take your two materials that you're trying to, get a, a test piece. Glue them together like way beforehand and don't be a procrastinator like I am terribly. Yep. And see if you can actually make it work beforehand because you just don't want to be surprised at the con. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, that's the biggest sure. um, For that reason, I'd say the okay. um, Velcro straps are probably a good oh, backpack strap. These are backpack straps. These are very strong. This is basically webbing. These are what you can use to attach, say, the sides of a breastplate together. Or wings. Or yeah, like wings. You're making a strap. You, can, you can have it go around your arm. You can have pauldrons and it will hold it to your upper bicep. You can also use this to hold across the... Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you can 
hold it, you can attach the pauldrons across the back so that you can keep some of the weight of your armor on your neck and shoulders instead of on your arms. And, and if you're making a piece that clips, you could really easily buy the extra endings for them, so you can get a Joanne's. Right. You need to make something that has a seatbelt for These are usually used as with buckles, essentially, with a parachute buckles. The, my favorite attachment method for armor are these tiny little things. I'm not sure if you can see them. These are rare earth magnets. These are a ton of fun. The armor I'm wearing is actually entirely magnetic. Wow. Magnets? This, yeah. this is all magnets. This does not move. In fact, I've had several people run into me today and my armor has not come off. You get these by rating. They will rate by the uh, poundage that they can hold. So if it says 7.2 pounds, these will literally hold 7.2 pounds of weight. That's amazing. Not write that down. Yeah. <laughs> so these are rare earth magnets. You can buy them in sticks up to 100, which I did, and it was 20 bucks, and it was the best 20 bucks I've ever spent. That's super awesome. Make sure you attach these with very strong adhesive because the magnets will actually come off of your fabric before they will detach because they're that strong. So if you try and take them apart, they're going to try really hard to snap back together. And if you wear enough of them, you get superpowers. <laughs> and if you stick your fingers between them, you get a hurt finger. Yeah. So we are not going to break people's room It's how to really get good at this, so check it out. Cosplay. Yeah, with that, 